what I want to do is I believe that your pastors, uh, have your pastors ever taught anything about renewing the mind? Oh, okay. All right. For those of you that are visiting, uh, uh, their pastors wrote a book about renewing your mind. So. All right. So I was going to teach you about developing a kingdom mindset, but really that message would have been completely to- focused on renewing your mind. And, 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 and something on the inside told me, you don't have to worry about that. You know, they, they, they've been taught on that. But now the, the, what I want to build upon is since they've already taught you about renewing your mind to a kingdom mindset, what I would like to teach you about today is living in a kingdom mindset. Yeah. See, there's one thing to renew your mind to get to this level, but once you're at this level, you still got to maximize that renewed mindset. So now what I want to talk about is just an impartation. This is not going to uh, a message that's going to get you emotionally stirred, but it's a message that's going to make an impartation in your life. It shall make a difference. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I want to talk about uh, living with a kingdom mindset. So a couple of words I want to uh, uh, just address real quick are kingdom and mindset. Kingdom, the word kingdom is important, and, and, and something just tells me that you guys have heard this word kingdom a little bit around here. So this is Kingdom Life Empowerment Center Church. And so from a kingdom perspective, we must understand that Jesus did not come to establish a religion. He came to establish a kingdom. He came to establish a kingdom. What do you mean by kingdom, Brother Pena? Well, uh, for those of my wife grew up under a kingdom. Now, we, uh, those of us that were born and raised in the United States of America, we grew up under a democracy. And so, so we grew up under the rule of a president, uh, but my wife grew up under the rule of the queen. And so that's different because the, the president has checks and balances, but nobody can check the king. So uh, uh, the president, the president can't just do whatever he wants. The president can go to jail for doing something wrong. The king just decrees a thing and it is established. So there's, there's difference uh, uh, between a presidency, a democracy, and a kingdom. And so, so my wife grew up in the kingdom. Now, the thing about a kingdom, especially uh, in olden days, uh, uh, all kingdoms had this desire to expand. And the way that a kingdom expands is through colonization. And so what, what, what a kingdom would do is that, for example, my wife's island, she grew up in the island of Dominica, Great Britain. If Britain wanted to expand to the islands of the Caribbean, what they would do is that, one, they would send their army and take it by force. So they would take the land by force. But after they took the land by force, they would then colonize the people. And they would change their language. And so, so, so they would change their language to say, okay, for example... Uh, uh, if there were if there were slaves there on that land and they colonized it and the slaves uh, uh, spoke a language from Africa, they would say, "From now on, you're going to speak English." Come on, sir. Come on. They would change the way that they spoke. They would change the laws. If they used to drive on the left side of the road, they say, "From now on, we're going to drive on the right side of the road." They changed everything, all the characteristics. Why? Because it had it was an extension of the motherland, right? It was ex- an extension of the throne. Now, another thing is that. For a king uh, to take his sons and promote his sons to kings, because Revelations 1 and 5 says that God has made us both kings and priests in the earth. And, and so for a king to promote a son who is a prince to be a king, that can only happen one of two ways. Either the king dies and the, king, the prince is therefore promoted, or the king can send the son to rule over a foreign territory. At that point, the the king bequeaths the land to the son. The king is still alive. The son is still alive. But now you're the king over that territory, and I'm the king of the whole kingdom. Right? So, So you're king, but I'm the king of the kings. Right? The word Lord means landowner. You're Lord, but I'm the Lord of the lords. Right? And so, so he's extending, he's colonizing. So God's goal, this book here, yeah, is the Bible. We could look at it as a religious literature, but also really is, is, is a form of legislature. It is an extension. These, this is the rule book. This is the legislature by which God's kingdom is established on the earth. So what the father wanted to do was colonize the earth with heaven. 
He wants to colonize the earth with, with heaven. We know that Adam missed it. Jesus come, he comes to reestablish this thing. Let's go to uh, Matthew, the third chapter. Matthew, the third chapter. We'll begin there. Um, he, this is Jesus. He's coming to reestablish. And the one that prepared Jesus' ministry was John the Baptist, his cousin. And so John the Baptist in Matthew, the third chapter, uh, I'll begin reading at verse one. It says, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Another translation says the kingdom of heaven is near, say near. So John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, is saying, repent. Now, the word repent, here's the thing, that w whenever there is a, uh, uh, if you don't understand the definition of terms, then if I'm trying to relay a concept to you and my definition of a word is different than your definition of the word, then inevitably there will be a misconception, right? So as I'm relaying this concept, there will be a misconception because we don't agree on the terms. The word repent when we hear repent, most of us, we think of running to the altar, rededicating your life to Christ, right? The word repent, all that means is change your way of thinking. It means change. It means you got to change your mind. So John the Baptist was saying, change your mind for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, we keep reading in the same chapter, John the Baptist's cousin comes up, Jesus, to get baptized. And, and we know what happened. John the Baptist was like, man, I don't need to baptize you. You need to baptize me. And Jesus said, no. And so they go to baptize him, and the voice came. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And so Jesus is baptized. He's come, he comes up out of the water. After he's baptized, the Holy Spirit descends upon him like a dove. Immediately, he was led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted, to be tested. Watch this. Watch this. You're, I'm going to talk a lot today about your kingdom assignment, about your purpose, it, about your vision. All true vision will be tested for authenticity. All true vision will be tested for authenticity. No one that's ever been used mightily of God was used mightily of God without opposition. So Jesus, as soon as he's baptized, he doesn't go out to minister without being tested. He doesn't go out to preach until he passed some tests. Yeah. Let me just pause right here and say, if you received your call to the ministry yesterday, don't think you're going to be in the pulpit tomorrow. Come on, come on. You need to be validated. Yeah. You, you need to be tested. If you haven't been through anything, then we don't even know if you'll be able to endure. And so Jesus, he endures the test, and every time he was tested, he responded with the word. And watch this. You can't get the word out of you if you haven't placed the word in you. So the Lord can't get something out of you that you haven't placed in you. James 1 and 5 says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask it of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Now watch this. Uh, uh, James said, if you lack wisdom, ask God. He didn't say if you lack knowledge. Had he said, if you lack knowledge, ask God, I wouldn't have to study. If he would have said, if you want some knowledge, ask God, he'll give it to you. I could put this book under my pillow. And ask God to put it in my heart by osmosis. But he didn't. He said, if you ask wisdom, if you lack wisdom, if you lack the ability to apply the knowledge that you already have, ask me and I will tell you how to use what you got. But you're the one that have to put it down in there. So Jesus obviously studied the word before his ministry. And so he has the word down inside of him because when he's out there in the wilderness, he doesn't have a Bible. And so the, see, here comes Satan and here comes the word. Here comes Satan and here comes the word. Here comes Satan and here comes the word. It's kind of like a sponge. When the pressure is on, what's in the sponge will come out. So when the pressure is on you, whatever is in you is coming up out of you. If you get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and you don't turn the lights on and you stump your baby toe, you know how that is, and something comes out and you're like, whoa! And you go, where did that come from? No, no, you put it in there. <laughs> Somebody say, check your input. Your output will always come 
as a result of your input. And so Jesus had the input, therefore he could give the output. And so he's tested. He comes out of that. Let's go over to the next chapter. He comes out of the wilderness. He's ready to preach now. This is his first sermon. This is the first thing Jesus said in his ministry. Verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Another translation says it's here. So John the Baptist was saying the kingdom of heaven is near. And Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is now. One said is near. Jesus said is now. John was saying it's coming. Jesus said it came, baby, because I'm here. This is a kingdom that he came to establish. He wants to colonize the earth with heaven. That's why when his disciples said, man, I believe that the secret to this thing, the secret to his life must be this prayer thing. So, so the only thing they ever asked him, they walked with him for three years and they never asked him. I mean, I know I'm from Brooklyn. I probably would have asked him. I said, if it was me and I was there, I don't know. I'm just saying. If I was there, I would have, after he fed 5,000 with, with two sardines and five biscuits. I would have said, yo, 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 Jesus. Come here for a minute. Holla at your boy, holla at your boy. Man, how you do that? You know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I would have just asked him myself. But, but they never asked him none of that stuff. The only thing they ever asked him to teach him was, Lord, teach us to pray. As John taught his disciples to pray. And he said, okay, you want me to teach you how to pray? Here's the pattern. You say, our Father, right? You have to understand that this is not some distant nor despondent God. This is not some God you're disconnected from. This is a loving, caring, and sharing Heavenly Father. You're not a servant or a slave. You're a son. And you come to the Father as a son, as a son has rights. My, my son goes in my fridge whenever he wants. He's not a servant nor a slave. Everything in the house is his. You come as a son. Our father, watch this, who art in heaven. Why is that important? Because he's not here. He is not here. He, come, he sent us here. So the fact that he's not here and I am here is telling me that he wants me to do here what he's doing up there. Hallowed be thy name. There goes that worship. Watch this. Thy kingdom what? Thy will be what? Where? How? We colonize the earth with heaven. The goal of the kingdom is to experience heaven on earth. You know, earlier we were worshiping. If there was anyone in here that didn't like that, you're not going to like heaven. If you don't like worship then you got a problem because once you get to heaven, there's a lot of worship. So what, what were we doing? That was just a glimpse. We're supposed to act down here what we see up there. So if we see something in heaven, then we ought to pray that for the earth. Now, if we don't see it in heaven, then we don't decree it for the earth. We don't see sickness in heaven. Not when we read about heaven, Right? We don't see discord in heaven. We don't see backbiting in heaven. So whatever we see in heaven, that's what we make a demand for in the earth because the Father is colonizing the earth. He wants, to we, he wants us to experience heaven on earth. We're talking about kingdom. Say kingdom. kingdom. We are to uh, uh, accomplish God's plans and purposes in the earth, and we do that by placing his kingdom purposes above our own. Amen? Amen. All right, so the other, the other word I want to highlight, I highlighted kingdom, now, let me highlight this other word, mindset, because I'm talking about a kingdom mindset. Now, from a mindset perspective, this is very important because all of us have a mindset, right? And so if I'm standing here and I have a mindset, that means that that's my soul, my, my thinker, my feeler, my chooser, my, my mind, my emotions, and my will. The way I think, the way I feel, the way I make decisions, that's all within my soul. That's my mindset. And if I, I will only operate within the level that I see myself operating in. So... So if, if, if you're comfortable, elder, are you comfortable behind the pulpit? Somewhat, right? So if the pastor says, hey, would you do the announcements? You don't have a problem with that, right? Because you've been behind the pulpit before. When you look within your, your sphere of influence, I call it the mindset. It's kind of like an invisible fence. So, so within your invisible fence, you see yourself standing in front of people. You don't have a problem with that. Now, who here uh, uh, 
does not like public speaking. Right? Okay, so if I were to ask you to do the announcements, now that's different. Because within your mindset, you don't see yourself doing no announcements. So when the pastor says, come on, come on, says here, and gives you the mic, you come up here, and you're fine until you get to this step. <laughs> right? Now, when you take this first step, your blood pressure goes up. <laughs> you take the next step, your pulse is racing. You get over here, all the power in your knees are gone. All the water in your mouth just... <laughs> It's like it evaporated all of a sudden, and you like, <laughs> and you know, you you said a few things, and then and you're like, uh, and you can't wait for the pastor to release you, and then and he releases you, and as soon as you take this step right here, the water comes back in your mouth, <laughs> the strength comes back in your knees. Why is that? Because you are operating outside of the way you see yourself. And you will never be comfortable operating at another level until you can see yourself at that level. So, yeah, renewing your mind is one thing, but now operating in that is something else. So, so if, if, for example, if, if, if uh, let's just use a plane, for example. If, if I'm a pilot, I'm not a pilot, but if I were a pilot and I'm in a plane, an aircraft, and I set the plane to an altitude of 40,000 feet and to a direction of, of 312 degrees, so now I'm at 40,000 feet, 312 degrees, and that's where I'm heading, right? But if I take, and I set the autopilot at that, 40,312, if I take uh, the handle and I force the plane to go down to 20,000 feet, I may be able to stay at 20,000 feet for a while until I let go of that handle. As soon as I let go of the handle, the plane's going to go right back up to 40,000 feet. I can grab it and turn it over here and go to 256 degrees. But as soon as I let it go, I'm going to come right back to 312 degrees. Why? Because that's where my programming is. And so if you come in here and you don't know how to operate in what the pastor's teaching you about a renewed mindset, you can get excited, high-five your neighbor, and two, do two backflips without, you know, pulling a hamstring. And you get excited about that word, and that word will keep you till Tuesday. And by Wednesday, you go right back, right? Because you, you, you don't know how to operate there yet. And so, so, and you're like, man, what's going on? I mean, you're, and you get excited and you say, man, uh, 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 this was a good word. And then you put the CD in on Wednesday because you're struggling. You put the CD in and you hear it and you get excited and you're driving to work and you missed your turn because you were so excited. Right? Hey, glory. I done missed my turn. You turn back around, you get there, and now that CD done kept you till Friday. And then you come right back. So, so you got to learn to be comfortable living in a kingdom mindset, in a kingdom mindset. So when, when you have a kingdom mindset and you're comfortable with it, uh, there's two things that are going to happen. Uh, uh, because you got to understand that for God to operate in your life, you must cooperate with the process. God, you are not a puppet and God is no puppeteer. God is not going to force himself on you. God is not going to impose his will on you. God is not going to force you to be blessed. You want to be blessed? You're going to have to renew your mind to be blessed, and then you got to walk in that thing. Amen? Yes, so a couple of things. Uh, uh, so what happens when you have a kingdom mindset? I'm going to give you two keys today. What happens when you have a kingdom mindset? Number one, you understand that your life is bigger than you. The first thing that happens is you understand that your life is bigger than you. Why is that important? It's, un it's important because when you give your life to Christ, you, you, you realize you first, I mean, you've heard about it before, but it really didn't register. And then the pastor starts teaching and, and now you have the Holy Spirit and the word, it just starts to make sense. And you, for the first time, recognize the fact that you have a predetermined, predestined purpose. That before your mother met your father, before the foundations of the world, the Father had a plan for you. And so you have this predetermined, pre-decided, predestined purpose, and now your job is to find it, then follow it with the goal of finishing it before you die. So now, so whatever you used to call success, now you got to change your definition. 
Because, see, now success is all about finding, following, and finishing that purpose. So what, whatever, whatever your life was about before then, now it's, it has to change as you renew your mind because now it's not about you anymore. So, so my wife, for example, I remember one time she came to me and said, she said, babe, man, we've been in the army so long and we ain't never been to Germany. I want to go to Germany. How come we never got to go to Germany, you know? I said, you know, I would love to go to Germany. I pray about it. You know, I said, hey, guess what, babe? Our life is not our own, you know? I mean, if, if it's in the Father's plans, you know, I guess we just have to go to Germany on vacation. But if it's, if it's in the Father's plans to be stationed in Germany, then we'll go. But if not, we can't because it's not about us anymore. It's not about us anymore. And so, so for example, we've been praying about having another child. At this stage in our lives, we have one, in, uh, one uh, that's a freshman in college, one that's a junior in high school. This little one here is five years old. I'm ready to move on. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> But the Lord keeps dealing with us about this thing. So once again, our life is not our own. So if that's what he wants, watch this. We'll learn this later. I got to submit to his will. Because when, when living with a kingdom mindset, you realize that your life is not about you anymore. Your life is about your assignment. And, and that liberates me. It liberates me because it liberates me from me. And it liberates me from you. Glory to God. Because in the church, and not this church, but there's some churches that there's some people that would love to just impose their will on you. They get a word, and I'm like, praise God. They go, no, 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 you don't understand. 2012 is all about A, B, C, D, you know? And so I'm telling you, A, B, C, D is where is that? I'm, t- I'm confessing that thing. Woo, A, B, C. <laughs> Woo, D, D, D. Hey, hey. And right now, 2012 is all about ABC. Are you doing some ABCD? I got some. We got an ABCD meeting at my house on Thursday night. And I'm like, okay, well, go ahead with your ABCD self. I'm over here with Element OP. You know what I'm saying? God done gave me some Element OP. Leave me alone. Let me be me. I'll let you be you. Knowing who I am frees me to be me, and it frees me from having to be you. I can celebrate the giftings and the callings and the diversities of God without jealousy. I don't have to be jealous about what God is doing in your life because God didn't give me what he gave you. But God didn't give you what he gave me. I tell this story when I first got saved. I've been saved, I think, maybe three weeks. And uh, I was in Kuwait, uh, and I was in this little container. Uh, uh, you know, perspective is something, man. I was in this little container. I mean, just imagine right now, you know where you live, right? Imagine if I were to tell you, hey, I got a deal for you. I got this container, like a shipping container, that I can drop outside, put a little AC unit and a bed and a TV in there. What you think? (laughs) None of us would want to live there. But in Kuwait, I had it going on. You know what I'm saying? I mean, because some people were living in a warehouse. They was like, man, your room is the bomb, you know? So anyway, so I'm in this container, and, and back then, uh, uh, none of us had, uh, uh, you know, there was no TBN in Kuwait, none of that stuff. And, and we had this thing, I don't know if you ever heard of it, called VHS tapes. Y'all remember that? Yeah, the kids are like, what you talking about, you know? So we had these VHS tapes, and, 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 and uh, I was watching um, T.D. Jakes, and T.D. Jakes had this, uh, this was during a, a Back to the Bible conference. This was when T.D. Jakes was still in West Virginia. You know, some of y'all don't remember that. But he was he's still in West Virginia, and he used to do these things called Back to the Bible Conferences. And T.D. Jakes was preaching up a storm. And I was, I was watching uh, T.D. Jakes, and I was watching the TV, and I was like, man, that's a bad dude, man. I mean, he's going on. He is preaching, and I'm looking at that thing. And, and this is like one of the first things I ever heard the Lord tell me, right? And I'm listening. I'm watching the thing, and I'm all into it, right? And I'm like, man, I want to I wanna preach like T.D. Jakes. And and I heard the Lord, I mean, the first thing, one of the first things I think I ever heard the Lord say, and he said, I didn't give you what I gave T.D. Jakes. And it's like all the air left my little container. (laughs) And, you know, and I had like a little bounce in my step, and I was like, like, you know, man, I I just got saved, so my mannerisms were still from Brooklyn, you know, I was like, man, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) And I'm like, Man, well, man, God, you know, that's messed up. You know what I'm saying? I mean, 
And then watch this. this. This changed my life. And then he said, but I didn't give T.D. Jakes what I gave you. Y'all could clap better than that on that one. Okay. So I started yelling at the TV, you don't got what I got. You know what I'm saying? You don't got what I got. What's up? What's up? You know? So I was going on. Why? Because God was, was teaching me. <laughs> Stop playing, y'all. God was teaching me that I have my own identity. That I have my own assignment. That I don't have to be a copycat. I don't have to be an imitator. I don't have to be a duplicate. I am my own person and I'm free to be me. So when I have a kingdom mindset, I, I understand who it is that I am. And, and so uh, I understand. I, man, this, and, and I operate therein. Uh, it, it allows you and it frees you to operate in your own purpose. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1, very familiar passage. Jeremiah chapter 1 and, uh, and verse 5. This is Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah, they called him the weeping prophet. Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5. The Bible says, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee to be a prophet unto the nations. So, before you were formed, before your mama met your daddy, um, I, I, watch this. I already had set you apart and you had a specific assignment. Now, what if Jeremiah wanted to be the choir director? Right? Now, if he would have done that and spent most of his life, like some of us do, trying to be something that God didn't call him to be, then that would just lead to frustration. Because you can't force God to bless what he didn't create. The Hebrew word for bless is barak. The Hebrew word for breathe or create is bara. When, when God breathed into his nostrils and he be, it became a living soul, he bara, right? Well, guess, guess what? God only baraks what he baras. God only blesses what he creates. And so you can't force him to bless something that he didn't give you. Frustration sets in when you're trying to make a demand on God for something that's not yours to have. And so, yeah, you thank God for your pastors, but you're not them. And so if you're sitting here trying to force God to make you them, he can't. And he can't bless what he didn't create. So you can fast. You can, I mean, you can starve. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and put a demand on God, but he will only barack what he borrows. So your goal is to find out what he borrowed in your life so you can walk in the barack. Now, once I find out what he borrowed in my life, then the barack will flow. Say this, powerful things happen when there is an alignment with my assignment. This is simple, but it's hard <laughs> because you got to find it. And it's all about finding your purpose. And when you find your purpose, when you make the alignment with your assignment, then the blessing will flow. It's not that it's not that the blessing can't flow is that you're off course. It's just that you're not in position. When you get in the right place, the blessing will flow. Remember um, uh, Jehovah Jireh? And we use that as a redemptive name of God. And we list it with like Elohim, El Shaddai, El Elyon, Jehovah Tesekinu, all those things. But, but guess what? Jehovah Jireh is not equal to the redemptive names of God in that regard. Because if you read the passage carefully, it says that when, when he was about to slay his son, this is Abram, uh, Abraham and Isaac, and, and the Lord said, now, stop. Over there, you'll find a ram in the bush in the thicket. And so he gives him the ram. Well, the Bible says that Abraham named that place Jehovah Jireh. And then he said, on the mountain of the Lord, it shall be provided. What was he saying? When in the right place, the provision will always flow. When you're in the right place, the provision is always there. God is not obligated to release provision where he has not first established vision. But when you get in the place that aligns with his vision, then the provision will always flow. Amen? Um, you must find it, follow it, finish it. 
Uh, your life is about kingdom plans and purposes, not about your comfort. Oh, you're going to mess me up now. Because we would like to say that God wants us to prosper, that he wishes above all things that we would prosper and be in good health even as our soul prospers. Father, I thank you that I'm the head, not the tail, above only, not beneath. I'm the winner, not the loser. I'm the victim, not the victim. I'm God going on. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm a blessed man. I walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor do I stand in the way of sinners. Nor, oh, glory. Do I see it in the city of the spirit? Yeah, all that is good. But if you ain't lined up with your purpose, it's not going to flow. You can't confess. You can't fast. You can't decree. You can't force God to bless what he didn't make in you. And so it's about his assignment, not your comfort. We need, we need to learn to have some nevertheless in our lives. Let's go, let's go to, uh, let's go to Matthew 26. Matthew 26, uh, and verse 39. Matthew chapter 26. We need to learn to have some nevertheless. Now, this is Jesus, the Son of God, God in the flesh. I mean, he was the incarnation. Uh, uh, of divinity. He was God in the flesh. Matthew 26 and verse 39. We know what happened here and he went a little further and he fell on his face and prayed saying, oh my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but thy will be done. Jesus was saying, look, you know what? This is uncomfortable. The time has come for the manifestation of my ultimate assignment, my ultimate purpose, and I would rather do it another way. And if it's possible for you to do it another way, fine, do it another way. But nevertheless, if, if this is what I have to do to fulfill my purpose, then that's what I'm going to do. you telling me that I can be a believer, believing that God wants me to prosper and still face opposition? Absolutely. All that live godly shall suffer persecution. The good news is that we have the grace for it. As a matter of fact, if I'm facing it, then I have the grace for it because the Father would never allow me to be tempted above that which I am able. But with the temptation, give me a way of escape. In other words, if I'm facing it, then I can take it. If I'm facing it, then God trusts me with it. Because if I couldn't take it, I wouldn't be facing it. So as a matter of fact, when I'm facing a challenge, instead of allowing it to depress me, I should allow it to encourage me. I can see the challenge and say, well, for two things. First of all, Satan, <laughs> is that all you got? And second of all, God, I thank you that you trust me with this. Man, I done graduated. Five years ago, I couldn't deal with this. But thank you, God, that I can deal with it now. Had the... First Corinthians says, had the princes of this world known what they were doing, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. When they thought they were killing him, they, what they thought they were winning sealed their fate. When the first drop of blood hit the ground, they were done. What am I saying? If the devil knew any better, he would leave you alone. The more he messes with you, the greater you get. Paul said, for me, we're going to see that in a minute, to live is Christ. Okay, Paul, okay, for you to live is Christ, we'll kill you. That's all right, too, because for me, to die is gain. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, so wait a minute. If you live, Christ, die again. Okay, I'm not going to let you live or die. I'm going to make you suffer. He said, that's all right, too, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. In other words, if you let me live, I'll serve the Lord. If you kill me, I'll go on to glory. If you make me suffer, I have a bigger crown when I get there. There's nothing you can do to change my attitude. I know where I'm going, and I'm stepping out by faith. I have a kingdom mindset. This is bigger than me. This is God's assignment. This is God's kingdom purposes for me. Let's go over to Philippians chapter 1. It, it, you need some nevertheless in your life. You need to understand that it's not about you anymore. It's about your assignment. Say assignment. Paul, in Philippians, verse, cha uh, verse chapter, first chapter, verse 21. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. What I'm doing now, I'm ministering. Yet what I shall choose, I what not. Now, tell me in English, Brother Pena, that's King James. In English, what does mean, man, I don't even know what I should choose. I would rather, he says in this passage, I would rather just die and go to heaven. But watch this, because it's better for you that I be here, I'm going to stay. What was he saying? My assignment is greater than my comfort. My assignment is bigger to me 
than my comfort. He goes on to say, verse 24, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you, so I'm going to go ahead and stay. Why? Because he has some nevertheless in his life. My assignment has to be greater than my personal comfort. Now, watch this. I'm not saying that you're supposed to be saved and miserably saved, but, but what I am saying is that just because you're saved, that doesn't mean that you're not going to face anything. And you can face it and still have peace about it. And you can sleep through a storm like Jesus did. So, so watch this. I don't, just because I'm facing things externally, that doesn't mean that I have to allow the external to affect my internal. My internal could be at peace even though my external is going haywire. Everything can be going crazy externally and I'm still at peace on the inside. Say amen to that. So learn to say nevertheless. And then uh, last point on this is that your time on the earth is connected to your assignment, not to the number of your years. Your time on the earth is connected to your assignment. Now, today, if, if, if there was something in the news that said, uh, last night, the young man here in Williamsburg was, was uh, killed by a hit and run, and he was only 35 years old. We would say, oh, Lord, he was so young. I mean, some folks would say he was a baby. I mean, so he still had all his life in front of him. And we would say, man, the Lord, I mean, it just seemed like the devil took him out before he ever got started. He was so young, right? Jesus was 33. Uh, were we... Can anyone say that Jesus didn't fulfill his purpose? Your purpose is not tied to a number. We don't know how old Paul was when he died, but Paul said, you know what? I fought a good fight. I finished my course, and I've kept the faith. Shortly thereafter, he was gone. He, 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 and when he wrote to Philippians, yeah, he still wanted to go, but he said, I'm going to stay longer because my assignment is not done. In the second letter to his son, he said, my assignment is done, so I'm ready to go. And shortly thereafter, he was gone. We don't even know how old he was, but the point is, once you fulfill your assignment, once you fulfill your purpose, then you can go. It's not about a number. It's about your assignment. This is bigger and greater than just you. And second point, and finally, everything you need to fulfill your purpose is available to you. Everything you need to fulfill your purpose is available to you. Now, what you need to fulfill your purpose may not be available to me, but it's available to you because it's, it's tied to your assignment. So that's why when people say, man, I see such and such driving this or living like that or with this and that, well, maybe that's what they need for their assignment. And if they need that for their assignment, everything they need for their assignment is available to them. I don't need to covet that. What I need to know is what's my assignment and everything I need for my assignment is available to me. I can make a demand on everything I need for my assignment is going to be available to me. So, so for example, God has called me to, to minister, uh, uh, to preach, and to, to lay hands on the sick, watch them recover, to, to minister uh, spiritually. So when somebody comes up here and is sick, I don't have healing, but I have access to the one that's the healer. And, and since it's part of my assignment, then it's available for me. And so I lay hands on the sick and I do my part, which is just lay hands on the sick and decree the word of God and, and release the power of God. And then he does what I can't do. Amen. Why? Because for him to operate through me, I cooperate with the process. All I do is cooperate. He operates. Go ahead, Go ahead. Oh, my God. Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm preaching better than you guys are shouting. <laughs> All right. A um, couple of things and we'll close this thing out. His instruction is equal always to his injection. His instruction is equal to his injection. In other words, he will never tell you to do something that he hasn't already equipped you to do. He will not expect you to do what he has not equipped you to do, but whatever he equips you to do, doggone it, he expects you to do. So here's it. So let me give you a couple examples. We don't have to turn there for the sake of time. So I'm going to give you one example in Gideon. So he comes up to Gideon. Gideon was a scared farmer. So he's a farmer. He's scared. He's hiding. He's, he's doing, he's threshing this wheat and, 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 Israel at the time was under the captivity of the Midianites, and the Midianites were, were, just, were just terrorizing them. And so here the, the, the angel of the Lord comes up to Gideon, and he says, Gideon, thou mighty man of valor. That's right. right? Here comes mindset, 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 mindset. My mindset is not ready for that. He says, who, who are you talking to? That's right. That's right. He says, you, mighty man of valor. He said, the Lord, the Lord is going to do something great in your life. He goes, me? He goes, I don't know if you know this, Mr. Stranger, but um, I'm from the tribe of Manasseh, right? And Manasseh is the weakest clan. And of the tribe of Manasseh, 
I'm like the weakest man. <laughs> so, so I'm the weakest man from the weakest clan. And, and, and here's the encouragement. that it, it wasn't about him anyway. It was about his assignment. God is in the business of making holy garments out of flawed material. It's not about you. It's not about your credentials. It's not about your education. It's not about the size of your bank account. It's not, it's not about your name. It's not about who you know. It's not about your connections. It's about your assignment and your availability. If you're assigned to do it and you're available to it, then he will grace you and you will accomplish it and people will be baffled. But here's the thing. Gideon is like, I don't know what you're talking about. I can't line up with that. And the angel says to Gideon right up front, he says, go in the strength that you have. This guy was a coward. God was speaking to a champion. Here's another, here's another nugget. God will never speak to your right now stage. He always speaks to your to be stage. Why would he speak to your right now stage? You know that when you look in the mirror. He speaks to your to be stage. He, he looks to your future and he gets a word out of your future and he brings it into your present. That's what a promise is. That's what a prophetic word is. And when you get a prophetic word from your future that comes into your present, that is confirmation of what the Lord has already implanted down inside of you. So if I get, if you get a prophetic word and you like, Lord, I don't even know. You don't need to figure it out. You just need to believe it because the Lord went over to your future, grabs something from your future, brought it over to your present, spoke it to you here. Your job is to receive it. Your job is to believe it. He said, go in the strength that you already have. And he's like, I'm not ready. And the angel's saying, you're ready. And he's saying, I'm not ready. He's saying, you're ready. Now, he took God through all types of paces, trying to get his mind right. Oh, would you make this wet? Would you make this dry? Would you make this dry? Would you make this wet? It took him all that time. But the whole time God was ready, he wasn't ready. But when his mentality was right, when he was finally ready, watch this. Look at your neighbor and say, when you get ready, then get ready. Oh, man. When you get ready, then go ahead and get ready. Because as soon as you're ready, then get ready because it's coming. It's coming. You, you think you're waiting on God. God is waiting on you. Everything you need. See, see, it's, it's there. It's there. His instruction is always equal to his injection. Everything he, if he told you to do it, you already got it in you. It's a matter of stepping out there. He says to Moses, one more example. He says to Moses, y'all sit down. Y'all mess with me. He says to Moses, he says, look. Uh, I need you to lead my, my people out of Israel. He says, well, look, well, I mean, who should I, what are you talking about? Who, when I get there, what am I going to say? He said, who should I say send me? He said, I am that I am. Tell him that I, I, I send me. And so, so he says, that, okay, but, but what do you want me to do in Exodus chapter 4? What do you want, what, what do you want? I, I don't even have anything. He says, you don't have nothing. What's in your hand? What do you have? What do you have? Use what you got right now. What's in your hand? A rod. Throw it to the ground. He throws it to the ground, turns into a, a snake. He jumped back. The Bible says he jumped back. And he said, go pick it up. He said, pick it up. <laughs> when I'm from Brooklyn, I would have had an issue with that. He said, I ain't from Alabama, nothing like that. You know, I don't play with snakes. He said, go pick it up. He said, pick it up. He said, okay. And then went to, he said, but pick it up by the tail. Lord have mercy. I don't know a lot about snakes, but I know you don't pick it up by the tail. You pick up a snake by the tail, that's asking for trouble. Ain't that right, Roy? Watch out. But what was he doing? He's saying, trust me. Trust me. And when he passed the trust test, then he was able to use what was already in his hand. It's already there. Will you trust him to use it? It's already there. It's not, it's not about you thinking that it's not good enough. It was just a doggone stick. God can anoint that thing. God will take what you have, what that little bitty thing that you have, two fish, five loaves, the, the woman uh, uh, who was the, the woman in Sarah, the woman who just had this little bit of oil, this little, uh, little uh, cruise. But God can anoint that thing. Whatever you have left, whatever you think is so small, if you trust God with it and you step out, he can anoint it. I'm almost done. A couple of things here. If it's God's will, then it's God's bill. If you ever, you ever been to a restaurant with your kids? Now, now, if you got teenage kids, you know that they go to a restaurant without you, right? And when they go to a restaurant without you, they order from the right side of the menu, right? So they don't even look at the left. The left is the food. They don't look at that. They go to the right. They look at how much money they got. Most of the time, it's not far, right? You know, they... They don't even get past the appetizer section. 
They look at how much money they got. They look to the left to see what that gives them. Man, I didn't even want that, but I guess I'm going to get that. <laughs> then they go eat with you. When they eat with you, dun, 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 they order from the left side of the menu. They go to whatever they want. Man, I've been waiting for this thing right here. Pastor got us fasting too. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Fast is over. Hey. It ain't over yet, but you know, we're going to get there. So they order from the left side of the menu. Why? Because you, they order what they really want. And they don't care about the price. Why? Because daddy will take care of it. Because daddy will take care of it. If daddy tells you to do it, then daddy got to take care of it. Okay, let me make it real practical. I'm in the army right now. These brothers work with me. If General Lawrence tell me to go work on a project, right? The project is $10 million. We work, the project's way bigger than that. Does Rick Pena have to come up with the $10 million? No, because it's not my project. Somebody missed that. It's not my project. I was sent to do it. And since I'm on assignment, then whoever gave me the project has to pay for it. The source of the assignment is responsible for the bottom line. If you give me the assignment, then you got to figure out a way to pay for that thing. It didn't come from me. It wasn't my idea. I was minding my own business, walking through life. I thought I was going to do something else. Here you come. Get a hold of me. Now you take me over here. I was, I was doing fine over there. I thought, now you take me over here. You done messed around. You got me out here in places. You, done, you got me out here at the risk of looking foolish, saying stuff I ain't never said before. Well, it's not up to you to come up with the, assign, with the resources. Whoever is the source of the assignment has to come up with the resources. If it's God's will, then hey, it's, it's God's bill. Last thing, you don't turn there, Mark 9 and 23. All things are possible to him who believes. All things are not possible for the one who doesn't believe it. So if you don't believe in healing, for example, and, and, you, and you have a problem with your back, but you don't believe in healing. So if you don't believe in healing, you don't believe that healing is for today, then healing is not possible for you. It's not that healing is not possible. It's just that healing is not possible for you. Why? Because you don't believe it. So all things are possible to him who believes. So, so let's, let's wrap this thing up. So I talked about uh, understanding that your life is bigger than you and understanding that everything you need to fulfill your assignment is available to you. So let me give you a couple of examples. So let's say you come to Christ and you're single. Let's say you're in your 20s and there's kids in here, so I, I'm going to keep it high level. But before you gave your life to Christ, you were fornicating, right? You were living like the world. I don't expect the world to live anything other than the world, right? I mean, I, I don't have any uh, notions about that. But now, you're in another kingdom. You've been translated in, out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son, and now under this new system of government, we tell you that you're supposed to be abstinent. You shouldn't have sex out of marriage. Now, that's new to you, and, and that's hard to you, right? You're like, man, what did I get myself into, right? But since it's God's will, then it's his bill. He will give you the grace to keep you until you get married. Because he will always grace you to do what he instructs you to do. And since he's instructing you to do it, then you have the grace for that assignment. You're married. You give your life to Christ. Before you got married, you used to tear your wife down. You used to talk about it all the time. You used to embarrass her in front of people. Now, the Bible says, this new kingdom mindset says that you ought to love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. You ought to love her so much that you're willing to lay your life down. And at first time you hear that, you're like, shh. Know about all that, Pastor. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But if he told you to do it, then you'll have the grace for it if you submit to it. It's all about your availability and your assignment. 
wives, you come to Christ. And, 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 and the Bible says now under this new system that you ought to submit to your own husband. Own, O-W-N, own husband as unto the Lord. And so, and, you, and you're like, what? But pastor, you don't understand. <laughs> no, you, you have the grace for it because the Lord is telling you to do it. And you come to Christ finally, and, and you're lost. And you don't know anything about purpose. And, and you're tired. You're tired of life. I mean, you, 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 you've you been doing this whole nine to five thing and, and the daily grind, and you have more month than money, and you've been just grinding this thing out, and you're looking, and you say, man, if I could do this for 40 years, then at the age of 65, they'll fire me, call it a retirement. By the time I pay off my house, I won't even be able to enjoy it. And is this all that life is about? And God says, no, I have a specific assignment for you. The problem is that you've been walking around for 30 years not even knowing it. But I'm so good that while you were lost, I was preparing you. And now that you're here, I can redeem the time. And if you would line up your life with your assignment, then the blessing is going to start to flow in your life like you've never experienced it before. This is, this is living with a kingdom mindset. This isn't just trying to renew your mind to it. This is just flowing in that thing. That Everything you, you see, you see it through the lens of the spirit. Everything you see, you see it through the lens of faith. You speak the language of faith daily. You're decreeing things and they're established for you. Why? Because you're lined up with your assignment. You're not worrying about other people. You support them. You pray for them. You appreciate them, but you don't have to worry about being them. And you're free to be you. And you're walking in this thing. Because it takes all of us to be the body of Christ. If, if everybody was like you, then we wouldn't be the body of Christ. We couldn't function. But all of us coming together, we are the body of Christ. So no matter what category you find yourself in today, there's an opportunity for you to make an alignment. Thank you, Jesus. To make an alignment, to make an adjustment. All of us, all of us, the Bible says all of us like sheep go astray. We all get off course from time to time. But today the Father sent me here to give you a course correction, to just kind of get you back on course. If, if, you, if you don't know Jesus and the pardon of your sins, none of this matters. All the stuff I'm talking about, it hasn't even started yet in your life. Today could be the day that it all starts. If you, if you were to die right now and you don't know whether or not you go to heaven or hell, today is your day. Today. Everything can change for you. If you know that you're saved, but you've been, oh man, messed up, and you, you've been walking outside of God's kingdom purposes, and, and, and today it's like the Father's saying, get back, get back, get back, get back in line. If that's you, the Father's here and ready for you today. Let, let's stand all over the building. Let's just do a couple of things real quick. Right now is not the time for you to worry about.